Uh, so hello everyone, uh, I'm Lewis McKenzie. I'm a third year PhD student in the Imaging Concepts group here at Glasgow. I'm currently writing up my thesis and job hunting. And um, today I'm going to be talking about oximetry using two wavelength oximetry uh, to look at and study the blood vessels that are on the outside of the eye. <coughs> and there's two vascular beds that you can see on the outside of the eye, the bulbar conjunctiva and the episcleral vessels. And um, this, this, the idea for this study sort of happened on one Monday morning. Uh, uh, every Monday morning in the Imaging Concepts group, we have a group meeting at 9.30, and everyone comes in a little bit bleary-eyed and tired after the weekend. And if you look at someone's eyes, <laughs> when they're a bit tired, you might see something like this. There's a large range of blood vessels easily visible. Uh, do, we know, this do we know this person? <laughs> <laughs> From Wikipedia. Uh, um, and um, there's two vascular beds you can see, as I said. So here's a simplified diagram showing you what's sort of going on here. You've got the sclera, the white thigh, the and uh, there's episcleral vessels embedded into the sclera. And uh, these are large vessels, sort of, if you're going to roughly say, roughly about similar size to uh, large arterioles and venules in the capillary, uh, sorry, in the retina. And there's also bulbar conjunctival vessels, which lie on the outside surface of the sclera. And these are diverse in size and contain many different arterioles, venules, and capillaries. And crucially, these vessels are in contact to the ambient air. And as Maruka mentioned, when vessels are in contact with ambient air, there will be oxygen diffusion going on. But when we started this uh, study, we looked into multispectral imaging of these vessels, and I could find nothing reported in uh, published literature about multispectral imaging oximetry <coughs> of these vessels. All I could find on conjunctival vessels was the use of a thing called Clark type electrodes for looking at measuring partial pressure of blood vessels underneath the eyelid which uh, are also conjunctival vessels, but slightly different from the ones on the outside of the eye. Um, but th these, uh, these uh, Clark-type electrodes have a lot of disadvantages compared to multispectral imaging oximetry, because these require contact, and they're non-imaging. You, you don't have spatial discrimination between arteries and veins, for example. They also have a temperature-dependent uh, calibration required. And, and crucially, if you're looking at vessels where oxygen diffusion may play a role, well, these uh, electrodes actually block any oxygen diffusion effects. So here are just a couple of images from a study in 2002, uh, where uh, these are being used to monitor uh, arterial oxygen saturation in a baby. It doesn't look like it's having a good time. Um, so there's basically three aims of this study. Uh, we wanted to see, can multispectral imaging provide non-invasive oximetry of these vessels? And the answer, to skip ahead a little bit, is yes, we can do multispectral imaging oximetry here. Um, we wanted to investigate the oxygen dynamics of these vessels, and we think these oxygen, the oxygen dynamics, particularly of the bulbar conjunctiva, which are exposed to there, are highly novel for in vivo oxygen dynamics. And we wanted to see if these blood vessels could yield useful information from this oximetry, and we speculate yes, but I would really like to solicit opinion at the end of the talk as to if people think that uh, there's useful information to be had here. Um, so the imaging system we used to study this was a, a retinal fundus camera modified with the image replicating imaging spectrometer, or IRIS. Habir talked a little bit about this earlier. This is a really useful device. It's a really nice research tool. Uh, here's uh, IRIS here, it's a little black cube, and this is our camera. And IRIS works by taking a white light image and spectrally demultiplexing it into eight wave, uh, individual waveband images uh, on a single detector. And it enables snapshot multispectral imaging, which gives us excellent time resolution. And if you look at someone's uh, sclera with iris, you get these, uh, an image a lot like this. And if you look a little bit closer, I'll just enhance the contrast a bit for the projector. Um, you, if you look at someone's square, you'll see this, which is a wide range of blood vessels, very diverse in size and shape. Uh, and red arrows have highlighted episcleral vessels, so the vessels embedded into the sclera. So there's fewer of these vessels, they tend to be larger. Uh, so there's some that seem quite superficial, and there's this one here that you can see going further deeper into the sclera. And in blue, there's the bulbar conjunctival vessels, 
which if I labelled every single one of them, the screen would be nothing but blue arrows. <laughs> uh, there are many, many, uh, and they also range in size very greatly, so large ones here and here, but also many smaller vessels leading on to capillaries, and it's a really diverse network. So for oximetry of these vessels, we looked at using, well, we used two wavelength oximetry, and we used 560 and 570 nanometers as wavelengths which provide high, relatively high optical absorption, which is if you look at these small blood vessels with 600 nanometer light, they're almost totally transparent. And uh, we did uh, vessel analysis in MATLAB using vessel fitting <coughs> uh, to, uh, to analyze transmission and also first uh, find vessel diameters. And uh, as you say, the optical density ratio that we measure is inversely proportional to blood oxygen saturation. And normally, ODR is directly calibrated to um, blood oxygen saturation and retinal oximetry, for example. We know that arteries should be at a certain value, or we assume that arteries should be something like 97% and veins should be something like 60 or 70%, and you calibrate optical density ratio to that. But in this study, we just report optical density ratio. We don't assume that we know the oxygen saturation of these vessels. So to validate uh, the oximetry capability of uh, these wavelengths, uh, we constructed a very, very simple phantom, which consisted of a piece of spectralon uh, to simulate the square. It's a white diffuse reflectance material with uniform reflection and visible wave range. And we used a 100 micrometer uh, FEP capillary filled with ex vivo flowing blood. And what we find is that optical density ratio did indeed uh, follow an inversely proportional relationship to uh, oxygen saturation as measured by a blood gas analyzer. So moving on to in vivo experiments, there was two components to in vivo experiments. The first of all was just looking at just the difference between normoxia and hypoxia and acute mouth hypoxia. So we had 10 healthy human subjects and we made a sequence of normoxia and hypoxia. So we went normoxia, hypoxia, normoxia, hypoxia, and then a final return to normoxia. And we, we induced hypoxia by subjects breathing uh, a lower fraction of inspired oxygen, 15% FiO2. And a really key insight here, which came courtesy of Tushar Chaudhry over there, was that we could control oxygen diffusion to bulbar conjunctival vessels by simply closing dilate. So getting subjects to closer eyelid for breathing hypoxic air, which uh, seems a, a very simple insight, but one, one that took us a little while to figure out, but it was good. And we, we also wanted uh, with the experiment to look at the behavior of oxygen diffusion from the air into bubble conjunctival vessels. So we took a subset of subjects which had both suitable bubble conjunctival and episcleral vessels and uh, uh, relatively close region of the square, so we could do a direct comparison between both vessel types. And uh, we imaged them for about 30 seconds, a rate of about one image a second, um, upon opening their eyelid. <coughs> so our results show that with hypoxia, we see an increase in optical density ratio. So this is an inverted scale here with hypoxia. So you see the change in both bulbar conjunctival and episcleral vessel. When we look at all subjects, Conjunctival optical density ratio increased across all subjects, and conjunctival vessel diameter did not show a statistically significant change in, in uh, vessel diameter. Although some vessels dilate in some subjects, conjunctival vessels dilated slightly, and some they constricted, and some showed little change. Adding up to this, not a statistically significant. In episcleral vessels, we see a statistically significant increase in ODR of episcleral vessels. And we also see all episcleral vessels increasing in diameter, which is uh, similar to the response to uh, retinal vessels with the hypoxic stimulus that uh, Derek talked about earlier, which may be an autoregulatory response, but I'm not really qualified uh, to talk about autoregulation as a physicist. But we see this increase in optical density ratio with hypoxia. So in other words, blood oxygen saturation drops with hypoxia, as you would expect. Now, the real interesting part of the study, the part that really interests me, is looking at this graph in particular. Now, there's a lot going on, so let me talk you through it. X-axis here is time in seconds, 
this grey line is at time t equals zero, before which subjects had their eyes closed, and after which subjects opened their eye. Now subjects were breathing hypoxic, a hypoxic air mixture at the time, so they're constantly hypoxic, hypoxic. And what we saw, if you look at this black line, this is the pulse oximetry reading for a fingertip pulse oximeter, and uh, this is a linear trend fitted to data points, and you see a, a good linear trend, and episcleral vessels also followed a good linear trend. Now, episcleral vessels aren't exposed to there, so the behaviour of the episcleral vessels corresponds quite a lot to the behaviour of the pulse oximeter, as you'd expect. But of course, there's this blue line here, which corresponds to the bulbar conjunctival vessels exposed to there, and upon eyelid opening, we see an exponential decrease in optical density ratio, which corresponds to a reoxygenation from hypoxic from a hypoxic condition to a more oxygenated condition, and uh, actually corresponds to what we, an optical density ratio uh, approximately the same as what we would observe at normoxia and with the eye open. So what we see is oxygen diffusion coming in. This is the really key thing, as we see this rapid diffusion. And uh, we can use this fit to calculate some parameters. So a little bit like you can look at radioactive decay and calculate a half-life. We could calculate a half-time to reoxygenation here in this particular measurement for this one particular subject. That's about three seconds. And when we repeated this uh, twice for four subjects, uh, it came out as an average of about three seconds for this parameter, half time to reoxygenation. And a really key thing I want to get across is we really needed snapshot multispectral imaging to achieve this. We really needed the high time resolution. Uh, I've used the uh, LCTF time, uh, time sequential systems before, like uh, the system they developed for UCL. And the time resolution there is a lot poorer. So by the time you would take a two wavelength data set, this oxygen diffusion would be gone and done and you wouldn't see the change. So this snapshot uh, ability of virus was really key in being able to see this. Um, now there's some consequences of this oxygen diffusion, which means that all the blood vessels on the outside of the eye in the bulbar conjunctiva will be very highly oxygenated when exposed to this ambient air for uh, even just a few seconds. Now the, the partial pressure of ambient air is about 160 millimetres of mercury, which on the oxygen dissociation curve is actually off the chart here. It's uh, somewhere over here, uh, very close to 100% blood oxygen saturation. So this means that if you wanted to look at artery vein difference in the bulbar conjunctiva, you're not going to see anything, uh, at least when the vessels have been exposed to the air. Maybe you'll see something after the eyelids have been closed for a long, long time. But any small if it's only a small change, it'll probably be turned out by the diffusion effect. So you really have to consider this oxygen diffusion if you want to design some oximetry experiments in these vessels. So the potential applications we could see for this, well, uh, the immediate one is uh, looking at contact lens wear. Uh, uh, contact lenses have varying oxygen permeability. And if contact lenses don't let enough oxygen diffuse through, they can cause hypoxia. And generally, this, people have studied the bulbar conjunctiva looking at vessel dilation due to contact lens wear. And one of the hypotheses is that this vessel dilation is uh, in part due to hypoxia. Well, you could actually test this with this multispectral imaging system. But it may also be interest for investigating diabetes and sickle cell anemia, which are two conditions where uh, the bulbar conjunctiva microvasculature is known to be affected. Diabetes, you can see, uh, reduces the number of capillaries visible uh, in the bulbar conjunctiva and also increases the average vessel diameter in, uh, compared to healthy controls. And maybe, just maybe, this is very speculative at the moment, but if we can measure this diffusion rate, maybe there's some interesting information in how fast oxygen diffuses into vessels. This will be a parameter not only of the oxygen, uh, well, depends on several things, but including uh, how permeable uh, vessel wall membranes are to uh, this oxygen diffusion, but of course there's, there's many things that affect this. So this is one of the things I want to throw out there and say, could that be of any use at all? Or is it uh, probably not actually that useful? Um, and for episcleral vessels, which I haven't really talked about a huge, much, huge amount, well, it's been shown that high intraocular pressure affects the blood flow in these vessels. So uh, with high IOP, uh, blood flow rates were, or blood flow velocity was uh, reduced 
Um, does this result in hypoxia? I don't know. Uh, but it's something you, you could test. Um, so, uh, some future directions we might go with this. Uh, well, these uh, public chondrotactyl vessels and epistolar vessels might be a good test ground for wavelength oximetry algorithms. Uh, there's no pigmentation in the way. Uh, public chondrotactyl vessels have minimal to no overlying tissue. And epistolar vessels, you can see some that go deeper into scleral tissue, so you could potentially use those vessels going deeper in to the tissue potentially as a probe uh, for, for looking at the effects of scattering. You, you know the deeper the vessel, the greater the uh, effects of scattering. And we also know at least one calibration point in that when the vessels are exposed to the air, the, well, the conjunctival vessels, they'll be highly oxygenated and close to 100% oxygenation. You could also look at adapting a slit lamp, which um, is a, I know there's a lot of ophthalmologists in the room, but I wasn't familiar with slit lamps. Uh, uh, at first, uh, slit lamps are high magnification imaging devices for looking at uh, mainly the anterior segment. And uh, if you have a high enough resolution slit lamp, you can do you can look at capillaries. So this is a capillary in green light, uh, and you can see groups of red blood cells flowing in vivo. And even if you really try really hard and you want to believe, you could see, let's say, think you could see uh, single red blood cells flowing. So there's potential for high resolution capillary oximetry or a red blood cell oximetry, but in vivo, but again, you've got to contend with this oxygen diffusion effect. So I just want to finish by saying these are readily accessible vessels for imaging. And oximetry in these vessels is feasible. The bubble conjunctiva goes, undergoes interesting oxygen diffusion effects. And uh, there's potential applications in things like contact lens, where diabetes, sickle cell anemia, and looking at high intraocular pressure. And uh, I'd just like to finish by acknowledging uh, the help of our collaborators in this. Uh, so first of all, Supervisor Andy Harvey for letting me pursue this uh, somewhat wacky idea. And uh, Tushar really especially for helping uh, encourage this wacky idea. And uh, maybe you're helping with Iris and Andy McNaught uh, for his uh, ophthalmological expertise. Uh, and I'd just like to say thanks for listening.